Thank you guys. Um, so next up, <coughs> excuse me, next up, we've got Scott McCoy, who is with Marriott International. He is their vice president of market operation and guest experiences. So as you guys can guess, he's a pretty busy guy these days. Um, he has been in the hotel industry with Marriott for over 33 years. Um, and we were very, very fortunate to get him today, thanks to Barry Cato, one of our tourism commissioners, who Scott is representing you very well here in the great state of West Virginia. Um, so thanks, Barry, and thank you, Scott, so much for joining us. We look forward to hearing what your global brand has to say about all this and how your chains and hotels are dealing with this. So welcome, Scott. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. I cannot okay. see you just yet, though. Okay. okay. Um, do you want to, uh, do you have control over my slides? Yes, we were, we are getting your slides up now and okay. I'm turning on your video. So give us just one moment. I'm sorry. There, I can see you now. Terrific. Uh, well, thank you, uh, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you today. Uh, we clearly know these have been very challenging times for everyone as we've tried to adapt to an ever-changing environment while remaining vigilant in our guest-centric approach. So really under the movie marquee heading of, I know what you did last summer, I'll try to address how we've approached the changed consumer psyche and navigated the many disruptions we've seen uh, with the hope ultimately of encouraging confidence in travel. So next slide, if you could, please. So this summer, we all had to adjust to a changed guest psyche. These days, nearly everyone is hypersensitive to cleanliness. So to flatten the fear, cleanliness has had to become elevated to a new level. Now, near surgical clean has become non-negotiable and cleaning itself has become part of the experience, even theatrical. As an example of this, we've seen that frequent, highly visible cleaning provides some peace of mind and a calming effect in our public spaces. Those facilities that have moved after hours or off time cleaning to prime time cleaning for visibility have made it real for guests. So optics do matter and have made a measurable difference. Amplifying the hypersensitivity impact though is a guest mix that has turned upside down. Now leisure, which is a higher capture rate for services and amenities and is less predictable, is driving occupancy at a time when amenities and services are reduced or in more restrictive jurisdictions not available at all. Further eroding the experience and the value perception over the summer were several disruptive forces. One, government intervention or restrictions are at different points, state to state, county to county, and city to city. Two, natural disasters, fires, hurricanes, and civil unrest peaked this summer, impacting many markets. Three, occupancy volatility challenged operational capability across the tiers from limited to luxury, weekday to weekend, swings were dramatic and eye-watering. The booking window also narrowly and dramatically changed from weeks to days to in some cases, even just hours. And finally, four, the operating model has become extremely constrained. Simply put, less occupancy means less resources. So in the middle of all that disruption, the common thread we've heard across the continents was we needed to flatten the fear, to encourage travel, that social distancing and masks really did matter and grounding our approach in science with familial messages to build certainty and more confidence was critical. So what we did was we partnered with medical experts to ground our advice in evidence, but we recognized quickly we couldn't simply be clinical in our approach. We had to tune the guidance for hospitality. So we and added we traveled together as a guidepost to suggest a shared responsibility for behavioral change with guests. These internal messages were designed to shepherd a portfolio of hotels across a wide range of conditions. It's worth noting, we recognized early on that the term new normal was being rejected as it implied accepting faith. And we knew we wanted to imply personal control for travelers as there's some comfort in being able to decide, ideally leading to increased personal responsibility to share in the small burden of protection. Masks, social distancing and sanitizer are all individual items that are hard to enforce especially in a bar, at a dance, or at a wedding. 
So we calibrated our mental watches to what's now. We established the right now, right this moment, we need to work on and influence things people could control. And since we don't know when now ends, we've leveraged everything we can to keep the guests at the center of our approach. Pondering service for 10 years from now or even 10 months from now seems contextually out of touch. Our focus is the current environment, providing guidance in today's travel experience, focusing on the heart of what we do well, which is service. So I'd like to note, uh, probably most importantly, that the biggest challenge we faced then early on and even today is the perception landscape is very inconsistent and constantly changing due to individual state, county and city interpretations of the CDC's evolving positions. Similarly, markets are at different points on the recovery curve. Most notably, perception appears to be based more on where you are from than where you are. As an example, there seems to be more fear perhaps in Manhattan, while others are frolicking in Miami. These disparate conditions from one market to the next have often resulted in demand spikes and demographic shifts, particularly on weekends, as travelers cross geographic restrictions for freedoms unavailable in their home jurisdiction. Sometimes referred to as revenge vacations, where people in closed jurisdictions cross boundaries to have fun, to get out of their basements, Think Atlanta, Marco Island, Myrtle Beach, and many other locations have experienced this, including mountain areas such as in West Virginia and tertiary markets, especially with an easy drive of large metro areas. Therefore, as I shared earlier, optics do matter. Level setting to the state, you know, really level setting to set the stage pre-arrival and at arrival with infographics, visual reminders, and some level of theater making expectations part of the journey to keep everyone contextually in the same story, on the same page, even as the story evolves over time in different ways, in different places. So communicating our POV through this lens of individual control and expectation versus a position of authority nourished a sense of duty to community, sparking personal responsibility and personal empathy towards others which we believe supports social distancing. Oh, excuse me, my screen is now going blank and I don't know if you can still see me. Uh, can you still see me? We can. Okay, all right, fine. My screen just uh, is updating something. So forgive me for the, for, the technical, uh, for the technical difficulties. So essentially we were communicating our point of view really through this lens of duty to community, sparking personal responsibility and personal empathy makes a difference for us, especially when it comes to the behaviors that individuals have to act on. So let me ask you to go to the next slide if you wouldn't mind. So what I'd like to do is I'll share a few examples of what we've been doing to inspire confidence. For 93 years, we've had a commitment to cleanliness, but with COVID, we've had to dramatically increase the frequency and enhance our disinfection to a higher level. And we're now using electrostatic sprayers with hospital grade disinfectant for public areas. We've also enabled guest control by adding disinfecting wipes in rooms and sanitizer stations at entrances and elevator vestibules. We've, we've expanded the use of mobile technology throughout our hotels with mobile key, mobile dining and mobile requests and increase the use of QR codes like we're seeing in many areas for menus and printed materials while removing all non-essential items such as menus, magazines, decorative pillows, ice buckets, et cetera, from rooms and public spaces. And borrowing most importantly from this, this idea of the psychology of architecture, we use design interventions to deliver a less contact, more connection approach in our public spaces. We've learned that cognitive mapping guides us to what's familiar. It directs us to move about a public space in a certain ways based on familiar cues, signage and physical design. So understanding those social desire paths, if you would, to help helped us to intervene and improve distancing. As an example, urban planners often build sidewalks after people have created a path across the green space. This is similar to what we've tried to do these last few months. We developed an approach that repurposed existing furniture to do more than just meet occupancy requirements, but to also create botanical shields or create compelling cozy small gathering spaces versus large. To encourage physical distancing, yes, 
but we also explored how these signs, optical uh, you know, changes that we made in the spaces and messages can move people and, and move them around the space in a way that is socially distanced while also being compelling. So to do that, we had to repurpose existing signage, but maintain different brand points of view and style. So as an example, some brands might say, mind the gap, other brands might say, be smart, stay apart, et cetera. All of those types of nuances and, and signatures to the way that we communicate had to be maintained while safety was first. We even considered the outdoors with subtle changes to how we cut the grass, cross-cutting the grass into now six foot squares to make it clear what six feet looks like while also creating an inviting sitting area in the outdoor spaces. Additionally, we incorporated ambient messages into the public uh, spaces through our music systems to share the importance of masks and social distancing, uh, as well as deploying signage, sheer curtains, acrylic shields, and other barriers as visual reminders of the message to reduce contact. Now we've been working on approaches to enhance meetings, including familiar tech like live streaming as we're doing here today, but also examining the emerging testing capabilities that are out there and available and emerging continuously practically weekly now in how to create bubbles or COVID free meeting spaces, similar to what you've seen with the NBA, NHL and others. Lastly, I'd like to touch just quickly on communicating in a mask world because it's one of the fundamental difficulties that we've all faced. Following the American Hotel and Lodging Association's safe stay guest checklist announcement in late July, we joined many companies in requiring all guests to wear a face covering in our hotels. This now means everyone, our associates and our guests wear masks as a, mean to, as a means to protect each other. However, it also means we've had to communicate differently. Before masks, a social smile could easily acknowledge a guest's arrival. Now masks have covered our familiar social smile, if you would, putting us in an uncomfortable position of having less contact and less connection. And we're compensating with gestures and muffled voices behind our masks. Unfortunately, this approach falls short of making an emotional connection. Yes, it is less contact, but it's also creating a significant smaller connection. To address this new communication barrier, we studied theater and pantomime approaches to body language and borrowed from experts who work with the hearing impaired to understand facial expressions, to learn how to smile with our eyes, if you would. Our guests have always seen our intention in our eyes. When we cared, it showed. So given guests are hyper aware of their surroundings and need to believe that our facilities are safe and welcoming, we had to be equally hyper aware of our expressions and had to learn how to express care in a masked world. In a masked world, the phrase, the eyes have it, takes on a whole new meaning. So if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, please. Let me, let me end by saying health and safety have always been at the heart of Marriott's approach to hospitality. And our company's 93 year commitment to cleanliness has never been more important than it is today. I know that culture is alive and well at the Charleston Marriott under the leadership of Barry Cadell and so many others in your wonderful state. On behalf of all of us at Marriott, I wish you all success in navigating the challenges we face. After all these decades, we know the fabric of our success is woven together with you. Thank you for letting me share how we spent our summer and good luck, thank you. Scott, thank you so much for joining today and for sharing those insights. Um, it is fascinating to me, you are a brand that's always been known for going the extra mile um, and being a leader in the industry, but hearing you talk about things such as mowing the grass and six foot squares and teaching people to smile with their eyes really gives us some good insight into the extent of research and testing that you guys have done this summer. I wanted to ask you a quick question. I know many of our partners on today um, are worried about meetings and conventions, right? Roger talked about it this morning. We know that that's one of the biggest challenges that the industry is facing right now. If you'll give us just a little bit more um, insight on what you all are thinking as far as meetings and conventions business, and if you could give one suggestion to the folks on here um, that work in that particular sector, what would it be? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, we're working on trying to understand how do we build certainty and confidence for the meeting planner. So not only do they, uh, not only do they feel a high degree of certainty in their choice, 
but that ultimately that we reduce the risk in that choice. Um, so what that means is we're, we're having to daily work with emerging technologies that are coming up that are, that are promising certainty, promising with confidence that they could deliver a COVID free environment. But most of our hotels, like many businesses, uh, have many entrances, have many individuals that need to come to and fro within that facility. So first and foremost, what we're trying to do is initially create an environment which is meeting all of the jurisdictional requirements that we see in every, uh, in every area, in every geography. Uh, number two, do so in a way that we, through virtual tours, uh, through something as simple as using your smartphone to walk around your facility while the client sees in real time the behaviors of your team, the physical spaces, the layout, the signage. Optics matter in this case and builds confidence. Of course, we've created parameters and protocols throughout all of our brands and through all of our facilities that meet the jurisdictional requirements, but more importantly, meet the safety protocols that we know uh, are near and dear to our clients and ourselves. So what my advice would be is to most importantly, introduce what you're doing in your facility to the client in a way that they can see it so that the promise comes to life. What you shared is real. Uh, and, and you have to do so in a way that is convincing and authentic to you as a business. We are attempting to do that. At the same time, we are attempting to embrace new technologies, which may involve building a bubble environment, if you would, like you've seen with the NBA, NHL, the uh, various um, uh, you know, government types of uh, you know, the, the Republican Party convention, et cetera. So these, these approaches are currently fraught with challenge because they are highly restrictive. Uh, similarly, you can, uh, when you arrive to get on an airplane, we know everybody that got on that airplane came through the same door. Uh, in a hotel or in a facility with many doors with people coming from the local environment, deliveries, et cetera, and other groups in the building, it's much more complicated. So what we're trying to do is create ways and pathways to build that confidence and certainty. And the most important way is to show your clients what you're doing make it real for them, make it authentic. That is very helpful. And it's, it's going to take all of us. We appreciate the leadership that you and your company have shown in working with the American Hotel and Lodging Association, putting together these guidelines. Um, and we will all be watching and working towards that same goal. It's going to take every single property in America to get people to feel comfortable with meetings again. But we look forward to partnering with you, partnering with US Travel, and partnering with all of our hotels and conference providers around the state to do that. So thanks for sharing your insight today. We know you're a busy, busy guy, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you. You're a beautiful state and a lot to offer. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So next up, we've got a snack break. And because we are not all here to have wonderful West Virginia treats, we have sent them to you all. So I hope you all received your registration box. In it, you should have a sweet treat from Appalachian Chocolate and a salty treat from Mr. B's. So please enjoy and join us back here at 2.30 for our next panelist. Thanks so much.